Let's open our Bibles to John 15 and verse 5. What we're doing is we're looking at one word in the Bible. It's the word fruitfulness. We started in the Gospel by Mark chapter 4. We looked at in chapter 4 how Jesus said when someone is born again, they receive the word, they accept the word, and they bear fruit. Fruitfulness always accompanies salvation. We looked at that as the the concept that fruitfulness is expected by God. It's a part and parcel of salvation. Now we've gone to John 15 where Jesus himself explains fruitfulness. And we've looked at that. We've we've looked at a series of questions. Uh, Does God know how to produce a crop? And remember when I talked to you about the seeds and sunflower and corn and how one seed could fill the earth in seven years. That's how fruitful the plant world is. So yes, God knows how to produce a crop. Then we looked at what crop does God want to produce in our life? In time and our treasures, he wants our attitudes, our actions to bear fruit for his glory. Now, how does God produce that crop in our life. John 15 explains that. God explains in the fifth verse, and I'll read it all to you. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, Jesus says, bears much fruit. Here's the key. For without me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is explaining fruitfulness. Now, the scriptures say we are supposed to be doing something. The scriptures say when we gather to worship the Lord and accompanying that, we gather and celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are supposed to be examining ourselves, not examining the people around us. This is not a time for us to go, hmm, I wonder if they have that in their life. Hmm, I wonder why they're doing that. It's not a time when we examine others. It's a time when we examine ourselves. What should we examine? Well, John 15 introduces us to what I like to call our spiritual checkup or our physical. You know, when you get older, you're supposed to go once a year and have the doctor poke and probe you and poke you and take blood and and tell you that you're getting old. And you pay him $60 or 100 to tell you you're getting old. And it's just a wonderful thing. And so every year you go and they tell you you're getting older. And uh, it's really helpful. You know, I enjoy it. I went for mine recently and he told me I'm getting old. You know, and, and he says at your age. And I thought, thanks a lot. You're older than I am, you know. Uh, but the nice thing was it was a new doctor. First time I've ever been to him. And he didn't say anything about my weight. The guy was about 50 pounds overweight. You notice you never talk about your problem, right? So he never told me I need to lose weight because, you know, he would have probably felt guilty. But it was a blessing to go there and find out I was old. But let's do a spiritual self-checkup. We're going to go through this fifth verse looking at every word. Before we do that, listen with me. Because we need to do a self-checkup of our spiritual health. Now, do you ever feel distant from God? When you come to worship, does this book seem very heavy? In fact, when you think about opening this book to read it, the Bible, does it seem hard to get it open? And when you get it open, does it seem like you don't get anything out of it? That's something we are supposed to regularly examine because sin will keep us from fellowship with God and from getting something out of his word and his word and fellowship with him keeps us from sin. So if you feel far from joy and peace, if you haven't known victory in your life, if you are not experiencing blessing, if you hope no one gets too close to you, right? Is that your fear? You hope no one gets too close to you and asks you some personal questions. If that's how you feel, if my challenge is to you to jump in, to serve, to speak up for Christ, to to jump into his word, if those push you away and you kind of go, oh, you know, that's a little radical for me. In fact, when I was preaching uh, up in Michigan, I, all I do is just repeat everything you've heard and I got, I got done with one of the messages and I, I told them about how one of the couples in our church did something radical. They sold their Suburban, they sold all the stuff they had, they quit their job and they moved over to serve the Lord in Belarus. 
And I said, that's radical, isn't it? That they thought that instead of getting ready for the good life and retiring and enjoying all the the prosperity you get in America, they went over to where everything is, is difficult and the heating isn't consistent and the roads are terrible and there's danger all the time. And they went over there to serve the Lord. When I got done... Uh, and said amen, you know, got done preaching and praying and walked off the platform, a man came up to me and he said, it's not that couple you told that's radical. He said, everything you said this weekend is radical. He said, did you know we are not used to in our churches hearing such confrontational from the word teaching? I thought, you're right about that. You know, we've gotten to the point in America where we just try and encourage everybody to just kind of be all right. And we don't allow them to realize we need to do a spiritual exam. We need to ask ourselves, are we going to get rewards in heaven? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about what God will say when you stand before him about how you lived your life? How you spent your time? How you invested your treasures he gave you? What your attitude was like toward people and what your actions of your body were in his sight? Because he sees us all the time. We need to think about that. And we need to wonder. And we need to, like the Apostle Paul say, that I am afraid to get out of my lane in the race because I don't want to be disqualified and lose my reward in heaven. But if uh, these or a myriad of other telltale signs of spiritual listlessness and barrenness have come across your path, then Jesus invites us to come to his vineyard and let him explain to us what it is he wants from us. Jesus, in verse 5, is talking about grapes. He said, I am the vine. He's talking about a grapevine. You are the branches, talking about the growth from the vine. And the purpose of the vine and the purpose of the growth is for the production of grapes. So Jesus is talking about grapes. And nothing was clearer in the first century in Judea where he spoke than vineyards. Now remember, Jesus is talking in this section to his disciples This is the last night. Jesus is on the last night of his earthly ministry. And he is facing the cross. It's looming before him. The shadow of the cross is is across his pathway. And yet he thought it most vital to spend his last moments describing the Christian life to his disciples. And so nothing was clear to these men. They lived, they walked, they slept, and they ate, often in the very shadow of the grapevine. In fact, the whole life uh, cycle of the people of Israel surrounded the growth cycle of their crops. It was an agrarian, agricultural, farming society. And so in their lives, the seasons of each Israelite's life were marked by the production of their crops. The grapevines would become heavy and laden with grapes. They would go through the the tremendous harvest time. And after the harvest time, they would go into their fall festivals as they celebrated all of God's goodness. And then they would go back to those same fields. And as the fall grew cooler and longer and and the the winter season came, they began the, the... pruning back and the preparation for the next year's crop. Their whole lives were bounded. The winter pruning of the vines after the fall clusters of grapes. And then the first buds of spring after the long winter. Then the vigorous growth of summer. And then again the joys of harvest in the fall. Jesus sums up in verse 5 everything about his relationship with us. He summarizes everything he taught by saying... This is what it's all about. I, the Lord God of the universe, am the vine, and you grow out from me. Everything in your Christian life is attached to, connected, and a result of you being livingly connected to me. You know, what's so interesting is he he doesn't say, uh, I am the church and you're the member of the church. He doesn't say that that I am the the son of David and you are off. What he describes, the, the essence, the final, the last message he gives them about their relationship with him. He says, you are growing attached to me. 
You know, that's what salvation is all about. This is life eternal, that you and I may intimately know Jesus Christ, be connected to him. Not connected to a church, not connected to a ceremony, not connected to an event that took place a long time ago, but today connected to Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is. It's a person. Salvation is a person that we don't know about, but we know him personally. We have experienced him. Christ risen is a historic fact. Christ in me is salvation and I in him. So Jesus tells them that his relationship to them is all about a delivery system. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branch, you're connected to me. Everything you need comes through me. You know, you can live. In fact, I was flying uh, a couple months ago. I flew right over the Hoover Dam. I thought that was great. I didn't know how they let our plane go over because of all the terrorism, but we went right over it. And I was impressed with how huge that dam is. And I saw all the huge conduits and power lines that come off that hydroelectric turbine, whatever they call it, where they make all the electricity. And I watched those giant transmission lines, and I watched them snaking across the desert, going toward all the thirsty, uh, you know, electronic devices we use. And I thought, you know, you can live right next to the Hoover Dam and have no water or power if you don't have a delivery system, if you are not connected to the power or to the water line. And that's how a lot of believers are. And Jesus says that the way that we are connected is understanding, verse 5. Well, what does verse 5 say? It's Christ's explanation of what he wants from each of us who know him. That explanation is eight verses long, but we're going to only look at the fifth verse. And Jesus chooses a very special image to help us grasp what he wants. It's like a catalog with pictures. He actually shows us exactly what it is he expects from us. And what he expects from us, he commands us twice in this little passage to do, verse 4 and verse 9. And that command is to abide in him. Now, anything God commands us to do is our responsibility. It won't just happen. You understand that? He didn't say save yourself. He didn't say that that we are supposed to impute ourselves. He didn't say that we are supposed to, uh, any of the other marvelous works, propitiate our sins. He said we are to abide. It's something he commands us to do. Therefore, we must respond with obedience. And that's what the fifth verse is all about. We can live right next door to anything, but if we are not connected to it, we won't receive it. And Jesus explains our lifelong relationship with him in eight words. I am the vine. You are the vine branches. He says, I am all you need, ever will need, all will ever, ever possibly need, and you need to realize you must stay close to me, receiving from me. Because apart from me, the end of the verse says, you can't do anything. You can do a lot, it amounts to nothing. First word, I, Jesus, who is the eternal, unchanging God of the universe, opens his arms to us in an intimate, personal relationship directly with us. He is not a distant God. He said, I, I am personally involved in your life. I am personally wanting to be all you need. I, he introduces himself to us. He says, I am your salvation. I am your vine. I am all you need. Wonderful thought that God doesn't use surrogates. He doesn't use uh, uh, other means. He personally revealed himself as the God who is with us. That's the Christmas message. Emmanuel, God with us. So I, he continues, I am. Jesus gives the seventh and final declaration of his divine relationship to us. In God's word, a seven-part truth is a complete set. So this is the seventh time Jesus has said those two little words, I am. He says in chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He says in chapter 8 that I am the light. In chapter 10, two times he says, I am the door and I am the good shepherd. In chapter 11, I am the resurrection of life. Just the previous chapter, 14, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. But he finishes the set here. And he says, I am the vine. 
He said, I am the bread, so we need never perish, John 6, 35. He says, I am the light that we need to live, John 8, 12. He says, I am the door we need to enter into God's presence in John 10. He also says, I am the good shepherd that we need, who loves us, leads us, and gave himself for us. He says, I am. At the grave of his friend Lazarus in chapter 11, Jesus tells us, I am the resurrection and the life. All that we need to live here and there in serenity, in security, in tranquility and peace. All we need, Jesus said at that graveside service, that he is our resurrection and life. The hymn writer says this, and and I've been singing it all week. I'm going to pull it out, my little song sheet from camp. This is what Jesus offers. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no schemes of men can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. He said, I am the resurrection. Then in chapter 14 in the upper room, Jesus conforms the the word of God, all the promises of God into one promise and he comforts his troubled disciples with a threefold cord that couldn't be broken. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I'm the way for today, I'm the truth for tomorrow, and I am the life forevermore. But verse 5 continues with the next words, I am, and then Jesus says this, the vine. Why did he say the vine? Why didn't he say the sunflower, the rose? Why didn't he say I'm the oak? or the olive, because vines were one of the most powerful ways to communicate an eternal truth to these men. I want to spend a little time talking about vines with you, because Jesus took the familiar vines, which are everywhere, almost every family in Israel in the time of Christ had grapevines. Those in the city had them growing, shading their outdoor trellises where they were outside. Those who were in the country grew them everywhere they had arable land. They grew them along the, the pathway to their houses. They grew them over the doorways. It was part and parcel of life back then. And Jesus uses the familiar to portray the eternal. The vine was Jewish imagery. It was the symbol of Israel. Grown all over Israel, as it still is, it was a plant that needed constant attention. That's why the Lord picked it as the symbol of Israel. And that plant, the best fruit, could only be gotten from it if it was grown correctly. Now, in the time of Christ, it was grown on terraces. The ground was perfectly clean. They had to work. They had to get the stones out. They had to till it and prepare it. And then they could grow their vines. Sometimes it was trained up on a trellis, sometimes creeping on the ground. And they would take forked sticks to keep it lifted up so it wouldn't get the leaves get dirty. Because when the leaves are dirty and the grapes get dirty, they don't come to harvest correctly. They don't ripen correctly. And so they would stake them up to keep them from the mud and the dirt and the dust. Sometimes it grew around the doorways of their cottages, but wherever it would grow, it was carefully prepared. But one thing about the grape is it grows luxuriantly. That means it flourishes once it's it's got good root system and it just grows greatly and the problem is the purpose of the grapevine is to grow grapes but a grape branch likes to just get longer and longer and get more leaves and if you don't do any cultivating and pruning of it it never gets around to bearing fruit it has to be forced it has to be terminated in its constant ramblings So it will focus on what it was intended to do. And that's why it's such a beautiful picture. If great plants are, little little vines are set in the ground, they have to be at least 12 feet apart because they creep 
over the ground at such fast speed. They'll just become a hedge. Well, first of all, Jesus uses a universal image. That's why he says in verse 5, I am the vine. There was no one living in Israel in the time of Christ's ministry that had not seen a vine and branches except maybe a blind person who had escaped being healed by Christ. Maybe they hadn't seen one. Everyone else had seen one. And so when Jesus set out to explain his relationship with his disciples, what he desired from those that were his children, he uses the most vivid, the most well-known, the most universal image. Secondly, Jesus uses a historical image. After the Old Testament era, the identification of Israel as the vine continued. In fact, if you look at the intertestamental period, that's between Malachi and Matthew, those silent years. In that time period, the the era is called in history the after Persian period, then the Greek period, and then in the Israelite history, the Maccabean period. That's when the Jews kind of exerted their power again. And the coins of of when the Jews got to power had Israel symbolized as a grapevine. So it's a very, very historic image. In fact, when Herod built a temple, Herod, the one that killed the infants trying to kill Christ, when he built the great temple in Jerusalem, the the largest symbol of Israel in the temple was this massive grapevine that he had built of solid gold. And he constructed and wove and twisted braided vines of solid gold and had them filling the whole outer area of the courtyard. And so wealthy Jews would bring offerings to God and they would hire artisans to make clusters of grapes out of gold. And so when you came to to worship the Lord, you would come and you would hook up one of your solid gold clusters of grapes on this massive golden grapevine in one section. And that was part of the glory of the temple and part of the offerings to God. And so everybody there, when they thought of the the grapes and the vines, they thought of Israel. It's a biblical image. In fact, if you were to turn to Isaiah 5, the Lord said this, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. It's a biblical image. Jeremiah uh, says this in chapter 15, I planted you as a choice vine. Ezekiel 15 says this, you have grown up as a vine in my sight. In fact, Psalm 80 records that you brought the vine out of Egypt. In the Old Testament, the vine actually had become the symbol of the nation of Israel. But that quickly brings me to something. The vine in the Old Testament is always a negative image. If you read what I just read, uh, all those verses, if you read around them, the vine is never used in the Old Testament for Israel in a positive way. It always spoke of degeneration. They were a fruitful vine, but they they never bore fruit for the Lord. They were a fruitful vine, but they grew in all the wrong places in spite of what he wanted. They never grew the way he wanted. It was always a symbol of degeneration. In fact, the point of Isaiah uh, 5's picture is the vineyard had gone wild. It was just growing everywhere and not cultivated. Jeremiah laments the nation turned to a degenerate and wild vine. So vines in the Old Testament are always negative when it's a metaphor of Israel. Because God says, I wanted to prune you, I wanted to cultivate you, I wanted to cause you to do what I have chosen for you to do, and you didn't want that. You didn't want me to trim your life. You didn't want me to to weave you into the trellis. You didn't want me to pick you up out of the dirt. You didn't want me to wash you off. You didn't want me to prune you from going your own way. You wanted to go your own way. It's a negative image. They were degenerate and wild. The only hope was a living connection to him. And we need to be connected to Christ. We need to live in him or we have no hope. It's not human descent. Being an Israelite that brought God's blessing, it was connection to him. Well, Jesus, Jesus then was using a very sobering image. Because the wood of the grapevine has the distinct characteristic that it's good for nothing. It does produce wood, but the wood is too soft to have any purpose in their economy. 
And so at certain times of the year, it was laid down by the law that the Israelites would bring offerings of wood to burn the sacrifices. And do you know what it says in the law? You can bring any kind of wood you want except the wood of the grapevine because it's worthless. So it's a very sobering image. And I want you to think that one of the sobering principles of the New Testament is that uselessness invites disaster. Every branch that grows off the grapevine that does not produce fruit is cut off. And not just cut off. Look look at what the scriptures say in verse 6. If anyone doesn't abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Now a little bit later in verse 5, we're going to see that that as well as verse 2, as well as verse 1, as well as verse 8 and 7 and 6 and 5 and 4 and 3 and 2, are all talking to believers. There is a consistency here. And the burning is Jesus saying, every time your life goes off in this direction, and that direction does not bring glory to me, and that direction of your life does not bring fruit to me, I am watching how I can cut that part of your life off. And that part of your life is going to wither. And in my eternal perspective, it's going to get thrown on a bonfire and burned up. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But it's a very sobering image. A second truth, the first being fruitless uh, branches uh, invite disaster. And uselessness invites disaster. But a second truth is contact is the key to all of our spiritual life. Contact. Abiding. Being connected. To Jesus Christ. Jesus lived connected to God. The secret of the life of Jesus. If you read the gospel sometime, just step back and watch his pattern. He couldn't live without communing with his father. He always was sneaking off early in the morning and going late at night. And they would find him in prayerful connection to God. My children have this little uh, Jeep someone gave us. A little has a big battery in it, and, and it drives around. But if it doesn't stay connected every night to the charger, the next morning it goes, and finally, it died. And they all come and they say, could you do what you do to that thing? And I go, yep, and I flip up the seat, and I pull the connector off and I hook it to the charger and after a night of charging boom, just runs right up the hills it's amazing we must realize that connection is the key we must live connected the secret of the life of Jesus was his contact with God again and again he withdrew to solitary places to meet him and we must keep in contact with Christ and connection takes planning and we must take deliberate steps to stay connected. I have my extension cord, I have my charger, and I have it right there next to the Jeep, and when I hear them, I can hear the sound of it. It makes this awful sound as it's running out of power, and I have made plans to keep it connected. We must realize that the key to all of our spiritual life is connection. A final truth here is any amount is sufficient. Think about this. Any amount of connection with the infinite eternal. Did you know, if you go to Hoover Dam with a conduit that's going to take 50 megawatts of power, that's sufficient. But if you come there and connect the electricity just with your extension cord, that's sufficient too. Any connection is sufficient because the connection is to the power source and he is all we need and so we should think about that take the one example to pray in the morning be it only for a few moments is to have an antiseptic for the whole day we cannot come out to the presence of christ to touch evil things without our hearts being smitten you see if you as My hero C.T. Studd used to say, if you meet the Lord before dawn, you'll beat the devil all day long. A person whose life is hemmed with prayer and the word is less likely to unravel throughout the day. And just as the, the Bible will keep us from sin, sin keeps us from the Bible. So we need to realize that any amount is sufficient. For most of us, Abiding in Christ will mean constant contact with him. For some of us, it's a mystical experience which is beyond words to express. But whatever abiding in Christ means in your life, that's what you need to be doing. 
Any amount is sufficient. Don't wait and say, I'm going to wait till I have four hours to pray like Martin Luther. Or I'm going to wait until I can read the Bible through seven times each word like Adoniram Judson or, or uh, Jonathan Goforth did. Or I'm not going to really do it till I can spend an hour on my knees like George Mueller. No, don't wait. Any amount is sufficient. We'll need, though, to arrange our life and arrange our prayer and arrange the silence we need in such a way that we never have a day that we give ourselves the opportunity to forget him. He commands us to abide in him. Well, look at the next few words. I am the vine, and here's the next part we need to look at in verse 5. You are the branches. Now think about that. When Jesus pauses to describe, to sum up, to to give the essence of the relationship that his disciples were to have with him, he sums it up in four words. You are the branches. That's everything we need to know. Think about what it means. When Jesus sums up the Christian life with his picture, we are a branch. Everything in our life needs to be connected to him. We are all that we are. All that we ever can be is because of that connection. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that our lives from salvation onward are attached to Jesus. Everything we say, we say with him because we're attached. You can't, you can't have a vine and branch without having them connected. Otherwise, the branch will not continue to exist. They only exist connected. And so you are connected to Christ. And everything you say, you say connected to him. Everything you see, you see connected to him. Everything you do, you do connected to him. Everything that, that we think, we think connected to him. There is a living connection. And everything we are flows through him. He's connected to us. That's what he's saying. But what's interesting, if you look at all eight verses, sin is never in the picture. Do you notice there's no mention of sin in any of this? It talks about cleansing. It talks about pruning. But he never addresses sin. Why is that? Because when he looks at them, he looks at them as we are, wearing his righteousness. He sees us without sin. The result is Jesus is asking the Father to remove anything that hinders our lives from being completely his. He says, my father, and we're going to come back to this in verse one, my father is the vine dresser. This is going to give, as we go through, we're actually backing up through this passage, but it gives you a whole different view of God, the father. Jesus is the vine and he is right there just being the source of all that we are. And we are attached and growing outward from him. God, the father has the pruning shears in his hand. And he's looking down those vines, feeling those vines, looking for signs of fruit. And if he feels down a vine, a branch of our life, and he goes all the way down and there's no fruit start, he goes, well, we don't need that branch. Tosses it, says, they don't need that. Think about that, because we're a lot like branches. What are, what are branches of a grapevine like? Well, first of all, they're unfocused by nature. If left untrimmed, a grapevine will use every available energy to grow long, woody branches to extend its territory and never produce even a meager bunch of of grapes. They'll just grow endlessly wood that's useless. Winemakers have learned early on that grapevines could be tamed by vigilant pruning of branches so that comparatively few buds would be allowed to grow. What does that mean to us? If, if branches of a grapevine are unfocused by nature, what was Jesus saying? He says, you're a branch. We in our lives are often doing so much that God the Father has to watch for just the right time to trim away from our life. It may be something good in the sense of not being sin, but it's good for nothing in the sense of eternity. Think of how much we spend our time doing is going to burn up. Think of that. Think of what you love to do. And ask yourself, will you be holding those things that you hold and treasure and cherish on earth so much? Will you be holding them in heaven? If not, you shouldn't love them that much. Because that's something that is not producing fruit 
for the glory of God. A second truth about branches, we like branches are focused by the gardener. The branch can't focus itself. The gardener focuses. The the pruner, he's the one that does it. When the trimming of the gardener is finished, the vine is forced to direct its life-giving sap to produce grapes. Under good conditions of both sufficient rain and lots of sunshine, the grapes are heavy in a vineyard. So we go through seasons of being focused by the Lord back on why we are here. These seasons usually follow retreats. They usually follow car accidents. They usually follow a good book or message we heard. They usually follow hospital times. They usually follow uh, great times of prayer in the Word. They usually follow losing our job or finding out we have a severe or even terminal illness. You see, God uses all kinds of seasons of pruning in our lives. It's amazing how with the death of a loved one or the diagnosis of a serious or even terminal illness, we immediately, as believers, get really focused on the Lord. That's part of how he does his pruning in our lives. Now, he'd like to do it in the Word, at the retreat with the message or the book or the Bible reading and prayer. But sometimes if the branch is just going off to nirvana, he has to really cut a lot off and it shakes us up and we focus on him. We like branches are focused by the father who's our gardener. We like branches are unfocused by nature. Thirdly, we like branches are pruned for fruitfulness. Major pruning was done in midwinter. When the vine would lose the least amount of precious sap, the process of cleaning and pruning the vineyard left a bare field with little stumps. I enjoy driving across the country because I see this in all the vineyards. If you go through any time October or late October or November, December or January, all you see are that just looks like these these stumps. They come up about that high, just fat. And there's all this trellis and you can just see miles of them. I mean, they radically prune those things back. More than 90% they're pruned back in the the wintertime. And that's because the spring will cause it to burst forth. Now think about this. In our lives, it's the fall and early winter that often sees the most pruning. These are our later years when we have pain and sickness and limitations and the most opportunity for growth and godliness. By the way, what... Vines produce the most fruit, the older ones. Every vineyard knows that. It's not the young ones that are just just starting out. It's the older ones. Do you know who God has picked to be the most fruitful people? The senior saints. The senior saints are the ones that know pain. And they know what's worth living for. 